It took Columbus eight years to secure the backing to make his trip. Several royal committees and monarchs considered his proposal before Spain finally It took Columbus eight years to secure the backing to make his trip. Several royal committees and monarchs considered his proposal before Spain finally committed. In return for making the voyage, Columbus was supposed to receive 10% of the revenues his trip generated. Spain never delivered. But then again, neither did Columbus. He never found the westerly route to the Indies. Columbus had a rough chart uh, that described for him a place called Sipangu, which is the contemporary Japan, being some 3,000 leagues to the west of Spain. A veteran sailor, Columbus knew to head south first to catch the prevailing winds. He couldn't be sure that when he launched out, backed by what we call the trade winds today, that when he got over there, he was going to be able to find a way back. Columbus set his bearings in direction by dead reckoning. He used a magnetic compass and guessed his speed by watching objects float by. And by reckoning the distance by time, he was then able to plot his course across the ocean. And what's interesting, of course, is that he, upon desiring to return, doesn't go back this way, doesn't even go back the way that he came, but beats north, goes north, until he finds the winds that he apparently expected to be there. He first landed in the Bahamas on what is believed to be Watling Island, and there encountered some Lucayan Indians. Uh, Columbus reported them to be gentle, to be unselfish, to be giving. Uh, he rewarded all of that by kidnapping them, and eventually, of course, uh, their policies of Spain led to their destruction. On the second trip, he was commissioned to set up a trading post in Hispaniola. This time, instead of three small vessels, he commanded an armada of 17 and founded La Isabella on the northern coast of the Dominican Republic. Situated on swampy, low-lying land, the city was abandoned for better locations, among them Santo Domingo, a city of many firsts, including the first church. Word of his discovery traveled quickly. Other European powers sent their own explorers. In the four years following Columbus's discovery, more than 80 voyages were made. Maps and logs from each voyage were not shared, but became national secrets. The so-called Old World, that is to say Europe and Africa, and the New World, both North and South America, as they've come to be called, uh, were linked permanently. And in an exchange, both in terms of culture, in terms of uh, biodiversity, flowed both ways. Almost immediately, the Spanish began to impose their beliefs. Missionaries accompanied Columbus on his second voyage and soon taught the Indians to read, write, and, quote, observe good customs, as well as play musical instruments for church services. But the education and conversion of the Indians came at a cost. Their potential equality in the sight of God was a threat the Spanish insisted on the natural inferiority of Indians so they could justify the Indians' enslavement. There was great debate in, not only among religious circles, but in uh, secular, non-religious circles, about whether Indians were indeed truly human beings. And that debate centered on the issue of whether Indians had souls. It was said by the Queen of Spain that uh, they should leave the Indians in, in peace except the cannibals and the Indians that were, had not a Christian way of living. So this is why most of the Indians in the West Indies were called cannibals, so that it gave them the right to kill them or to, to bring them to slavery. A scenario destined to repeat itself began on a number of islands. First, an expeditionary force explored the island and searched for gold. Any rebellious Indians were enslaved or killed, and a brief gold rush followed. A few years later, with the mines exhausted, the settlers moved on. Hundreds of thousands of Indians died, some from overwork, some from collective suicide. What really conquered 
this part of the world with smallpox. Uh, you see, the Spaniards brought smallpox to this part of the world, uh, Columbus and Act et al, Amer Amerigo and all the rest of them. And this part of the world, especially the Amerindians, had no resistance to small smallpox at all. They were a totally virgin people. And of course, when smallpox hit them, they died like flies. Islands that had gold became Spanish settlements. Those without gold were raided to supply more Indian slaves. For instance, the Bahamas were completely depopulated. Well, the Spanish, uh, for the most part, were not interested in agriculture. They were only interested in acquiring or exploiting ready mineral wealth, that is to say, silver and gold. None of the lesser Antilles from St. Croix to Trinidad had that type of mineral wealth to exploit. There were some silver and gold mines in Puerto Rico, some in Hispaniola, and of course, much more in Central and South America. As a consequence, the Spanish focused their efforts there in, in those regions where ready mineral wealth could be exploited. Ultimately, the Caribbean became a way station for riches shipped from the mainland. Settlements on the main trade route were fortified. If you see a Spanish fort, assume this was a stop on the main trade route. The, the Pope formally, uh, you could say, gave uh, the Americas to Spain. So uh, once you sailed up to the Caribbean, you first of all already entered Spanish territory, but once you slipped through the islands into the Caribbean Sea, then you were in a Spanish lake, so to say, yeah, Spanish inland sea in their eyes. So you had absolutely no rights to be there as a non-Spanish um, boat. Spain controlled the Caribbean. To break their monopoly of trade, European adventurers began to attack Spanish shipping. No one did more to hasten the decline of the Spanish Empire than Sir Francis Drake. The greatest uh, episode in the history of piracy was Drake's overland attack on Cartagena. Uh, Drake actually captured the city and sacked it before uh, having to withdraw, uh, having quote-unquote singed uh, the king of Spain's beard. Certainly signaled to other European powers, the French, the Dutch, who were also engaged in piracy and privateering activities, the signal that the Spanish were no longer uh, immune from this sort of attack, even in their strongholds. For the next 100 years, a rogues gallery of pirates sailed the Spanish main. The pirate Blackbeard was as eccentric as he was notorious. He braided his beard with colorful ribbons then accented the look with cords of slow-burning hemp. His favorite drink was a mixture of rum and gunpowder, and he was married to no less than 14 women. Anne Bonny fought with a ferocity that could match any man. She sailed with another woman, and together they became known as the Bloody Sisters. When their ship was attacked, her drunken husband and his men hid below, leaving the women to fight alone. Anne was captured, but escaped being hung by pleading she was pregnant. As for her husband, he went to the gallows with Anne's benediction. Had you fought like a man, you need not have been hanged like a dog. During the 1660s and 70s, Port Royal was one of the world's richest and wickedest cities. Located near Kingston, Jamaica, the pirates openly flourished there for two decades attacking Spanish treasure ships that sailed past their coast. Port Royal was destroyed by an earthquake in the late 17th century and slid beneath the sea. Port Royal's most famous citizen, Sir Henry Morgan, plundered ships throughout the Caribbean. But he didn't confine his activities to the high seas. He sacked whole settlements in Cuba, Venezuela, and Panama. The British eventually arrested him, but in a surprising stroke of luck, he gained the favor of the king, was knighted, and returned to Jamaica as lieutenant governor. Morgan is 
interesting also in that he used his, the wealth acquired in his years of piracy to establish a legitimate political base or power structure on the island of Jamaica. And paradoxically, in his later years, actually was in the position to have to prosecute pirates. While gold put the Caribbean on the map, it was sugar that built the economy. The climate was perfect for growing sugar cane. For the next 250 years, the Caribbean's fortunes rose and fell with the price of sugar. The great sugar plantations were established in the early days of English colonization, the late 1600s. A cheap workforce was needed, and African slaves were imported to meet the demand. When the slave trade finally ended, over four million Africans had come to the Caribbean, changing the islands forever. Growers produced two products, muscovado, a coarse sugar, and molasses, which was used in the making of rum. The potential profits from successful trading voyages were enormous. Sugar became virtually as good as gold, and the island's economies flourished. Well, you must remember that in the 17th and 18th century, sugar was a very expensive commodity and a great luxury. And the planters in Jamaica, the sugar planters, made a great deal of money. They didn't make very much sugar. They would make it by the hogshead rather than by the ton but uh, they made an enormous amount of money nonetheless. The planters and their wives instead lived a life of luxury, especially in terms of social life, entertainment, glittering dinners and soirees and balls, uh, great houses filled with exquisite uh, mahogany furniture crafted in Europe or in North America. The West Indies were considered so economically valuable because of their produce of sugar, molasses, rum, cotton, tropical hardwoods, that, for example, at the end of the Seven Years' War, France, as the loser of that war, was willing to cede all of French Canada to the British to retain one island in the West Indies. They considered one sugar-producing island in the West Indies to be more valuable than all of French Canada. The richest colony of them all was France's Haiti. It alone provided more profit to its mother country than all of England's 13 American colonies. But changes occurred and the prosperity ended. The Americans freed themselves from the British. The French overthrew their own monarchy. Liberty, equality, and fraternity reigned. But nothing changed for the slaves in Haiti. Slavery in Haiti was more brutal than most. And it was as a result of that long-standing repression and brutality that caused the slaves in Haiti to plan an insurrection which by its magnitude caught the French in Haiti completely unprepared. And under the leadership of Toussaint L'Ouverture defeated French forces. Toussaint L'Ouverture even governed Haiti for a while before Napoleon sent thousands of battle-tested troops to retake the island. Toussaint's army was overwhelmed. Although he didn't live to see it, the rebellion Toussaint L'Ouverture led became the first slave uprising in history to achieve freedom, and Haiti became the first nation in the Caribbean. Over the next 50 years, slaves were freed throughout the Caribbean. Sugar production declined, and when German scientists found a way to extract sugar from sugar beets, profits fell. Sugar could now be produced more cheaply on the continent and consumed without shipping. With its gold reserves exhausted and sugar less profitable, the Caribbean dwindled in importance. At one time, the region had produced the most prized colonies on the planet. Now only Cuba still contributed to its mother country's treasury. Colonialism was ending, and a new era was about to begin. Stay with us. History of the Caribbean will continue.